This episode is brought to you by Fernanda, Rob, Doug, Tom, and Nick and Debbie, this week's newest patrons. Thank you so much. Cruising on a sailboat is basically, in its rawest description, living on a sailboat and sailing around the world while dodging the weather. From hurricanes in the Atlantic to typhoons in the Pacific to the East Coast parade of boats slowly heading south, because we aren't allowed to leave mainland U.S. for the Bahamas until November because of the insurance companies, but nobody wants to be north of, like, Charleston because it's too cold. In the 1970s, sailing was all the rage. It was taking the world by storm from the ocean racing yachts that we would get headlines on the news from every week to the proliferation of people moving their families onto cruising sailboats to escape high fuel prices, and things like the rat race. And one company stepped up very notably and made what is arguably the best family cruising sailboat ever made. In fact, to this day, it is still rated as the most popular production cruising boat over 40 feet ever. So what if somebody today tried to reinvent that formula? What would that look like? How much would it cost? And could somebody actually pull it off? This week on Everything You Need to Know, what might be the best family cruising sailboat again? The center cockpit. That old cruising boat I'm referencing that took the world by storm in the 70s is, of course, the Morgan Out Island, the 41. They made a bunch of bigger ones too. They made this thing from 1970 all the way to 1991. Over 1,500 of this boat are out there and sailing, even to this day. And even though they've been out of production for 32 years, you can still buy one. These things are fetching about 70 grand right now. And it's hard to overestimate how important this was to the sailing world in the 70s, and for a few good reasons. Um, of course, with your family, when you're buying a cruising sailboat, the first consideration is going to be safety. So Morgan gave you 30,000 pounds of boat to make sure that you were safe in high seas or terrible anchorages, things like that. They also gave you the ever important center cockpit, which is crucial to this design of boat for a couple of reasons. First, it gives you a midship safe place for anyone outside with high combing, so falling out is actually very difficult. And also midship up high like that, you have visibility all the way around the boat, so you don't really hit anything. And it's a great place to run all of the sailing lines so that you can actually sail the boat with ever, without ever having to leave the cockpit and go up on deck. And most people add an enclosure to their center cockpit, and it lends itself really well to that. So you sort of get this extra outdoor living room so the kids have somewhere safe to play and hang out. But also key to this design, a center cockpit effectively gives you two sections of the boat on the inside, which works really well for a family. You get this sort of forward section that contains the main saloon, the living room, and the galley. And forward of that is the V-berth where you'd put the kids. And then all the way at the back, at the other end of the boat, a nice quiet aft private stateroom for the parents. It's exactly what you want if you're going to have kids on board. How many houses have the master bedroom directly beside the kids room? Not very many and there's a reason for that. Of course this design also gives you a very good size engine room in the middle to make maintenance and taking care of this boat a lot easier and it'll provide you with the big fore deck and the big aft deck for sort of outside living space to expand your living area. As long as you can make that whole design sail fairly well, it really is a win-win. Outside of the fact that arguably, I think they always look kind of weird. I've never seen a center cockpit that I would say is fairly pretty. Now center cockpits never really went away, but if you wanted to capture the magic of the out island line of boats in a modern setting, something that's made in this millennium with today's technology, today's expectations for comfort and interior space, and make something that sails better? How would you do that? Well, somebody has done it, 
And before you get on me for the brand, hear me out because you might be surprised how amazing this boat really is. The brand is Hunter. In the early 2000s, Hunter, maybe not knowing it at the time, started to build what might just be the new Out Island, the new family cruiser, a center cockpit sort of boat that would give the aspiring cruising family everything that they wanted as far as safety and comfort and space and sailability within a reasonable price range. The main example I'm talking about is, of course, the Hunter 45cc, also called the Hunter Passage, the 456, and the smaller brother, the 420. Um, and I can feel some of you are already getting ready to attack me in the comments in all caps because you don't like the design of these boats or the construction of them, and it's Hunter, and they're not blue water. And This isn't, though, your bleach bottle 90s Hunter floating condo. This is something a bit different. This Hunter is built with a modular design, so they do the hull um, in the stringers and everything, but they do the interior separately on the floor of the factory where it's actually built outside the boat, and then they lower the whole thing into the boat in a modular sort of a design, and then it's all bonded together with Kevlar, Kevlar stringers and Kevlar bonding and reinforcements that effectively create what is actually a unibody for a lot more strength than the traditional design. This allows them to do a much better job with the interior and the structure of the boat before they bond it all together. They can use different manufacturing processes to make everything that much stronger, and they reinforce everything. And this isn't some lightweight hunter at the end of the day, like the plastic bleach bottle at the end of the dock. This thing comes out with a dry weight of 23,000 pounds, and that's one heck of a solid boat. And before you think all that weight and added space is going to be slow, these boats can move. The hull was designed by Henderson, the same dude that did in the same couple of years, the Legend 36 and the Legend 38. At the same time, he did this 45, and those things can sail. So you get stability and sort of fast and well-mannered, and they tend to weather fairly well too in the rough stuff. And Hunter didn't cheap out on this boat. They partnered with companies like Harkin, for all the gear. They did Lumar for all the winches. There's no second-rate stuff here, even the electric winches. And they use the company you want them to use with the diesels. They used Yanmar, not some knockoff thing from overseas. And up top, of course, you get an in-mast furling, so the main's easier to use. You get inboard jib tracks, so you can actually point this boat up into the wind in some sort of respectable manner. Okay, so it sounds like a good boat on paper, but what makes it the ideal cruiser for your family? Well, we know from our couples cruising episode last week that the boat for your family can't be too big um, for a couple to actually handle it and dock it and anchor it. And this thing being 45 feet is hitting that sweet spot very, very nicely. Plus, with the center cockpit, the helm is much closer to the bow, so communication while anchoring or picking up a mooring is a lot easier. And comfort is better for the seasick spouse or the seasick kids. Because the cockpit is more midship, it's not right at the back of the boat bouncing up and down in rough seas. It's in the middle, over the keel, so it sort of pivots. It's a lot more sea kindly. Basically, all that's left to do with this design, if it's going to be successful, is to pack as much as we possibly can into the 45-foot hull in terms of comfort and safety and livability. And of course, Hunter will not disappoint in those categories. As you come down the companionway steps, you're treated to the vastness of this main saloon that looks more at home in a 50-footer. There's ample room here for the kids to hang out and watch TV or work on their homeschooling. And for family movie nights, everybody has a seat. The galleys to starboard in the C shape give you, gives you loads and loads of this counter space, which you're going to need if you're going to feed all these people every single day, several times a day, if you're into that sort of thing. This one gives you a double stainless sink too. And instead of two small sinks that people usually do, one of them is actually big enough for plates to fit in. What a concept! We even get a three burner stove, which will be necessary with all those people on board. And this stove has a range hood with a light and a fan like your house. And we get a built in microwave right from the factory. You'll also find a front loading fridge and freezer with two doors, an additional top loading freezer in here, 
and it's tight enough in here that you can use this galley while you're at sea, but it's big enough to be comfortable to actually cook in it. It doesn't feel like they sort of cramped or shoehorned this galley into the space like it does on some boats. To port, we get something that is very important to me, and I expect a lot of you. We get a dedicated nav desk with a captain's chair that looks really comfortable. It looks like a chair out of a car. This, for me, sells this boat, because not only do I need somewhere to chart and plan passages and scour Navionics for things we might run into, but I also need to work on my laptop. I've got to edit some videos, maybe do some gaming, or just surf the internet. It gives somebody a nice, private, out-of-the-way space to do what they need to do on the computer. And of course, one of the major reasons a family would really enjoy a boat like this, the parents' stateroom at the back, the aft cabin. And this one is about as good as it gets. With a walk-around queen, it's got built-in end tables on either side. It's got a couch off to one side with its own private access to the bathroom. Pictures like this are what sell boats. And this broker did a very nice job with this ad. You even get a spot at the foot of the bed for a TV and some storage, which is perfect. If you put a mini fridge in here, I am set for life. The head, of course, adjoining, is large with a separate shower. So your toilet paper is not going to get wet. And all this is on a 45 foot boat that you can buy for less than 200 grand. This is big boat luxury and space and accommodations in something that you can actually afford with this type of lifestyle. The V-berth is nothing to scoff at either, with a very large bed and then a small seating area on starboard that could definitely keep the kids happy and enough space for them to play with their toys with access to yet another head, with yet another separate shower on a 45-footer. The ability for this boat to function on the day-to-day -day as a full-on floating home is excellent. It's so well thought out. This particular boat is actually very well equipped too for the price they're asking. You even get a standalone generator that's factory installed to provide all the power a family could need. And they've taken the time to painstakingly document this boat. If you're going to buy one of these, this might just be the one you should buy. And all of this in a 45 footer that's not even a bad looking boat. Here's the old Morgan for reference. And here's the Hunter again. Honestly, I think this boat just works on basically every level that it needs to work on to be the perfect family cruiser. So why wouldn't you buy it? Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make this whole channel possible. Um, a big shout out to all the existing patrons. I couldn't do these videos without you. Thank you so much. If you get value from these videos or you want to help out, please consider becoming a patron. The only real reason that anybody's going to tell you not to buy this boat is because it's a hunter. Or, for the more articulated amongst the internet experts, it's because it's not a blue water boat in their opinion. And that I think we need to explore that a little bit with a couple of things. First is a post that I found that sums up, in the best way I've ever heard it explained, why that might be a silly question on whether this is a blue water boat or not. Let me show you this post from a man named Don from SV Illusion. And credit to Don because this is the best explanation, the best way I've ever heard it worded, that I've ever seen. Don says, to quality my opinion, I should state that I've had the great opportunity to make a circumnavigation a number of years ago and throughout that experience, never ever heard people actually doing it make some of the totally irrational statements I've read here on the internet. Sounds like Don's been on the internet. Seemingly by people who have no clue what offshore sailing actually entails. I may be incorrect in this presumption, but the vast majority of comments derogatory toward any manufacturer, including Hunter, seem to support my belief that these folks have never done it, never circumnavigated, never gone long-term cruising. Surprisingly, that minor detail seems to escape them as they appear quite content to speak authoritatively regardless. To this point, nowhere at no time and under no circumstances have I, during that trip as circumnavigation, ever heard a conversation amongst cruisers criticizing a particular brand boat. The obvious reason is that we're all too busy complaining about breakdowns, repairs, spare parts, provisioning, water and fuel supplies, etc. Regardless of what boat or who made it, I guess there's more important things. Seemingly, the most problematic boats 
were the so-called gold platters made by the proverbial highest standards with so many systems that problems were epidemic. I think what he's saying here is the overcomplicated boats that were way too complicated to be out world cruising. He goes on, we saw every conceivable type, size, and make boat imaginable, and it was abundantly clear that no generality could be made about any of them. They were all there and floating nicely at anchor in most places that people have never heard of. To do so here is only indicative of one thing, that the authors simply don't know what they're talking about. Good point, Don. He continues, in a storm, it is far more important how the crew managed the boat than who made the boat. It was far more important how old the sails were than who made the sails. Same with engines, rigs, mast, and lest I forget, coral can't read the nameplate when it's chewing up fiberglass. And I think Don's point is so clear here that any further comments from me are just unnecessary. I think to add to Don's point just a little bit, um, are these boats that are for sale? These are the hunters I'm talking about. And the inquisitive mind might wonder while I show you this, how they got there. Here's one, for example, in Croatia. And here's one in Italy. Here's one in Greece. And one in France. And one in Cyprus. This list goes on and on, which is not bad for a little plastic boat made in Florida to be being sold all over the world. How did they get there? The way I see it, there's only one real counterpoint you can make against these mid 40 foot hunters, the passages and the 456s and the 450s. If you were gonna be crossing an ocean with your family and you get caught out in some kind of wild, horrific conditions, which could happen, is there a better 45 footer that you would want to be on instead of this? My answer would be yes. My answer actually would actually be hell yes. The 23,000 pound hunter we're looking at can do it, but is there a better tool for the job? Sure, we just have to make some compromises. Let's say we wanna keep the total comfort and luxury in the interior of the hunter, but we wanna add maybe beefier rigging, a bit thicker fiberglass, and let's say an extra 10,000 pounds of weight just to throw the waves out of the way. No problem, we can do that, and here, is the $350,000 Island Packet 440. Basically the same layout inside for $200,000 more. I think you see my point. So is this Hunter Center Cockpit the new Out Island? Or is there a better family cruiser that meets all of our needs without costing all that much more? Let me know what you think in the comments. Also, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. And if you can, subscribe. It's free for you and it would really mean the world to me. Until next week, keep the heavy side down, but not too far down. I'll see you.